Good morning. Good morning. 
Welcome to worship here at First Lutheran Church in St. James, whether you're here in person or you're streaming via our Facebook uh, Live, we welcome you. It is good for us to be gathered this morning for worship. A few announcements. Uh, the flowers that you see here in the sanctuary this morning are from the funeral service of Alvin Sandmeyer that took place yesterday. We continue to hold Alvin's family and friends in our prayers. Uh, we also um, hold uh, Terry Broughton's family and friends uh, in our prayers. Uh, his uh, funeral service uh, will be this Wednesday. The February newsletters have, uh, have been sent out and uh, so you can take a look in your mailbox, your email, uh, or uh, your mailbox at home, or you can let us know if you want to receive your newsletter in a different way than you currently do. Just give the church office a call and let us know. Sunday school classes uh, begin again next Sunday. And confirmation resumes on the 2nd. We have our annual meeting following worship service this morning at 1030 in the sanctuary, as well as via Zoom. You can uh, take a look at uh, your bulletin either uh, here or online to, to find how you might join us via Zoom. Or stick around if you're here and we'll start shortly after worship there is still a chance to uh, to contribute uh, to the donations going towards uh, hunger relief as part of the Super Bowl uh, campaign uh, the soup pot is out there in the gathering space and uh, we continue to take in uh, donations until uh, till the Super Bowl. Um, so you can take a look at your bulletin uh, and, and see where that money is going. Um, but lots of folks have already donated and we thank you for that. Are there other announcements for the good of the community? All right. With that, I invite you to rise as you are able as we begin our worship service with the order of confession and forgiveness found on page 94 in the front of your red hymnal. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God who forgives all our sin whose mercy endures forever. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have turned from you and given ourselves into the power of sin. We are truly sorry and humbly repent. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things we have done and things we have failed to do. Turn us again to you and uphold us by your Spirit, so that we may live and serve you in newness of life, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. In the mercy of God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead to sin and made us alive together with Christ. For by grace you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit that Christ may, <clears throat> may live in your hearts through faith. Amen. 
Let us go into singing our opening hymn, number 593. Before we go into the first part of our liturgy, we want to pause, uh, as we have been doing the last few Sundays, and just comment on one aspect of our liturgy, the work that we come to do together in worship. And today we want to lift up the hymn of praise, which we'll be singing in just a minute. There are lots of hymns of praise in our uh, hymnal, but we continue to sing one in particular uh, on many Sundays, and it's the one that begins this way. Glory to God in the highest and peace to God's people on earth. It is a verse from the Christmas story where the multitude of angels announce to the shepherds uh, about the Messiah being born. Often this hymn of praise follows the Kyrie where we're, we ask God for mercy. And in response to that request for mercy, the announcement comes that God has shown mercy, has shown his grace in Jesus Christ. And so the pastor announces uh, that verse, uh, glory to God in the highest, and you respond uh, with this hymn of praise, this wonderful hymn that has been used for centuries and centuries. And in that hymn, you lose, you become the church. You lose all aspect of, you know, what you want, and you give your praise to God, the triune God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, all mentioned in this hymn of praise. As you uh, do the work of the church that the Holy Spirit has called you to do, you point to God, you lift up God, and you say, this is the one, this is the only one uh, who is uh, Lord in our lives. We 
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to God's people on Almighty and ever-living God, increase in us the gifts of faith, hope, and love, and that we may obtain what you promise, make us love what you command. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Please be seated. We have children present in our sanctuary. I invite them up for a children's message and also welcome those who are uh, live streaming with us to kind of tune in as we have a children's message. Anyone want to come up? In our uh, Bible reading today, one of the readings uh, talks about love and really is talking about God. And one of the things it says about God is God is kind. And I just think that that is a, a description uh, that is wonderful about our God. God is kind, or love is kind, is what it is actually the verse says. It's a wonderful description of our God. And as we follow uh, in faith our God, it becomes a description of what God would want us to be in this world, to be kind. But it's hard to be kind sometimes. And let me give you some examples. Sometimes you are in competition with people. And let, let's say uh, sports is one example. And how do you be kind when you're trying to tackle somebody in a football game or when you're trying to win the game? But it can be done. You can do what the sport asks you to do and still show kindness to your opponent, show kindness to the one you're even trying to win against. Or if you lose, you can still be kind uh, in that moment of, of accepting uh, loss. Now there's a story that's told around these parts. Uh, it happened not so long ago, actually. And uh, it was about a cross-country runner who was running a race. And one of her opponents, one she was running against, uh, tripped. And she stopped. And she helped her up, and she made sure that she was OK. And then she went on with the race. And that's a good example of being in competition, but saying, and yet, we can still be kind. Well, there's other examples, too. I mean, there's, I think, another good example is when you're in school, when you're in class, and there are some of your classmates that maybe you don't get along with, or maybe uh, they're just different from you, and it's tempting then to treat them differently. But God would say, 
Uh, let's, uh, let's see how we can be kind to one another. So let us pray for this. Blessed are you, Lord God, in your kindness to us, you have shown to us the wonders of Jesus. Help us to follow him in being kind to one another. In your name we pray. Amen. The first reading is a reading from Jeremiah. Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, Ah, Lord God, truly I do not know how to speak, for I am only a boy. But the Lord said to me, Do not say, I am only a boy. For you shall go to all whom I send you, and you shall speak whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Then the Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, Now I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up and to pull down, to destroy and to overflow, overthrow to build and to plant. The word of the Lord. Be to God. Please read responsibly Psalm 71, 1 through 6. In you, O Lord, I take refuge. Let In your righteousness, deliver me and rescue me. Be to me a rock of refuge, a strong fortress to save me. For you are my rock and my fortress. Rescue me, O oh my God, from the hand of the wicked. From the rest of the unjust and cruel. For you, O oh Lord, are my hope. My trust is the Lord and Upon you I have leaned from my birth. It was you who took me from my mother's womb. The second reading is from the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians. If I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all my possessions, and if I hand over my body so that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. But as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know only in part, and we prophesy only in part. But when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part, then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. And now faith, hope, and love abide. These three, the greatest of these is love. The word of the Lord. Be to God. Please stand for the uh, um, Epiphany verse.
Holy Gospel today is a continuation of the story we began last Sunday. It is from the fourth chapter of St. Luke. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus began to say to all in the synagogue in Nazareth, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. They said, Is not this Joseph's son? He said to them, Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, Doctor, cure yourself. And you will say, Do hear also in your hometown the things that you may have heard you did at Capernaum. And he said, Truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. But the truth is, there were many widows in Israel at the time of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up for three years and six months, and there was a severe famine over all the land. Yet Elijah was, not, was sent to none of them except to a widow at Zarephath in Sidon. There were also many lepers in Israel at the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them were cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. When they heard this, all the synagogue was all in the synagogue were filled with rage. They got up, drove him out of the town, and led him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built, so that they might hurl him off the cliff. But he passed through the midst of them and went on his way. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise you, Lord Christ. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. They were filled with rage at what Jesus had said. They planned to hurl him off the hill, the cliff, and I suppose to kill him. That's quite a reaction to Jesus' message to them that day. Who were these people? Enemies of Jesus? Is this near the crucifixion when he's kind of made a whole lot of enemies? No, this is at the beginning of his ministry. And this is at his hometown. People who knew him and watched him grow up or grew up with him. Nazareth. He had lived there for, we believe, 30 years. And then one day, Jesus left Nazareth. And where did he go? Well, the hometown heard stories. They heard that he went down to the Jordan River to hear John the Baptist preach, and that he even went uh, into that river to be baptized by John. They heard that after that baptism, he, he kind of vanished for a time. He went into the wilderness. No one knew where he was. But then they heard that he had come back. And he was going to neighboring towns. He was being welcomed to speak in their synagogues, their gathering places for worship. And people were impressed at what he said. This is what the hometown has been hearing. So they're wondering, will he come back here? Will he speak for us too? Well, he does. He comes back to Nazareth, and he's there over the Sabbath day. So he goes to the synagogue with them, as was his custom. 
And they say, well, let's, let's have Jesus speak. So they hand to him the scroll of the prophet Isaiah, ask him to speak for them that day. He unrolls the scroll, he reads from the prophet Isaiah, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to bring good news to the poor, sent me to proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. What a beautiful passage. What a beautiful passage for Jesus to choose to read to them. I'm sure they were uh, anxious to hear what he has to say about what he had to say about it. What will he teach us about that? And he says this one sentence, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Well, in that statement and in what follows, Jesus, I think, is trying to redefine himself to his hometown. And I believe what he's saying to them and to us is this, that he, when he reads this passage, is not really referring back to Isaiah, as if to say, the Spirit of the Lord was upon Isaiah, you know, centuries ago. And he had anointed Isaiah to bring good news to the poor and proclaim release to the captives. Jesus is saying that this passage will now be fulfilled in him. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, Jesus. The Lord has anointed me, the one who grew up here in Nazareth, to bring good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind. Jesus is redefining himself, no longer a carpenter, not even just a rabbi. He says that he is a prophet, the one through whom God will be working. Jesus lifts himself up and proclaims himself as one who now will live out this role. At first, the response to what Jesus had said was pleasant. They said, what a gracious, gracious message. <clears throat> but then as it sinks in, <clears throat> and they realize that he's referring to himself as a prophet and that God is going to work through him, they began to think, wait a minute, isn't this Joseph's son? Which is to say, is, this is, isn't he being a little big on himself? This is just Joseph, I mean, we know all about him. He can't be a prophet. Jesus, the prophet of God. The ending of the story makes a little more sense when you understand Jesus as a prophet because when people are filled with rage, uh, it's usually uh, because a prophet has spoken to them. That's generally the response, not always, but generally a response a prophet will get. Prophets and the word that they bring from God upset people. It's not meant to be a comforting word like a a shepherd or a pastor to the people. But a prophet comes to fill the role of challenging the people. So Jesus is doing his job. He's getting the right reaction for his role as a prophet. And this is what is important for us to see. We will also see Jesus in a new way in our lives. And it's not so much what Jesus says in this passage as just understanding who Jesus is now as he begins his ministry. He is going to be God's prophet. He's going to be much more than that, too. We're going to come to know him finally as the Son of God. But in this passage, a prophet doing the work of Is that Isaiah proclaimed. And as a prophet, he will not back off to avoid upsetting people. In fact, he'll bear a cross rather than back off. 
Jesus is not worried about offending others. And in one commentary I read, he went out of his way to offend them. He could have stopped after that initial comment of today the scripture has been fulfilled in your reading. He could have just ended it there and they would have thought, oh, those are gracious words and left it at that. But he kept going. Not to meet their expectations, but to meet God's. Now, what I like to do in, when I'm studying the scripture like this is to kind of analyze it and say, okay, what exactly set them off? What was it that he said that uh, made them so enraged? I like to do that. I like to proclaim those kinds of things. But for this sermon, let's set that aside. Let's keep the focus on Jesus and his role as a prophet. And hearing the reaction that the, of the people was, was rage towards Jesus. I'll ask you the same question I asked of myself and of the men's Bible study on Friday. What could Jesus say to upset you? What would he say that would fill you with anger? Would Jesus do that? Yes, he would. He is a prophet. He has a word that is challenging to us. While we're happy to hear that Jesus comes with comforting words many times, words of acceptance and forgiveness, we will also want to tune our ears to God's word when it challenges us, his hometown people, his church. What would get under your skin? I think it's hard for us even to imagine because I think the things that would enrage us are our blind spots. And we, we just have unquestioned assumptions and until they're questioned, we can't even imagine what they would be. But when the prophet comes and questions them, then we'll know. Sometimes I've talked to people who were raised in the church but have left. Either no, no, no longer want to be active in the community of the faith or just not believers in Jesus anymore. And two thoughts come to mind as I ponder my conversations with them. The first is, that they really haven't come to know Jesus. I mean, they, they got to know Jesus at a Sunday school level, uh, and then in their adult life, you know, that just wasn't uh, an image, uh, a person that appealed to them. And I thought, boy, if you could only come to know Jesus as I've come to know him uh, and love him, as someone who uh, has adult things to say to us, you know, um, not just as we understood him in Sunday school, I said, boy, maybe then you would put your faith in him. But the second thought that comes to mind is that maybe they have indeed come to know Jesus in an adult way, and they don't like what he has to say to them. They don't like the challenging words, the prophetic words that call them to change. And it's not wanting to hear it, it's easier just to not be a part of the place where you hear it. God's word comes to us in different ways. Certainly we speak often of the gospel being a word of acceptance and comfort, a word that sets us free, good news. But God doesn't leave us there. God's word is also for us a prophetic word, a word that needs to be said to push us off our complacency with the way things are, to awaken us to our sin, to call us to faithful living. The prophetic word of God does not sound like good news at first, but Jesus doesn't come to win our favor, but to free us from the deceptiveness of our sins. And that takes a challenging word sometimes. 
And it has to come from someone who has the authority to speak it. And Jesus has that authority. He is filled with the Spirit. He is the faithful one who has borne the cross to bear this truth to us. To encounter Jesus is to be changed. Jesus announced the day in Nazareth that he had come to change things, using the words of the prophet Isaiah. But you don't go around the world just changing this and this and this, as if it just needs to be tidied up in a couple places. To change one thing in this world is to change the whole world. And that change that Jesus seeks begins with you and me. Amen.
I invite you to rise as you are able, as together with the whole church, we confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Spirit of the Lord is poured out upon us in abundance, so we are bold to pray for the world, the Church, and all that God has made. Each of our petitions will end with God of grace, our response, hear our prayer. Let us pray. Guide your church, O Lord, in the ways of faith, hope, and love. Cultivate ministries and communities of compassion that bear witness to your enduring presence among us. God of grace, hear our prayer. Teach us to live in humility on the earth, Curb arrogance that leads to destruction of natural resources and disregard for future generations. Inspire the work of scientists who urge us to live in harmony with your creation. God of grace, hear our prayer. You are the refuge of all who seek hope and freedom. Accompany immigrants, refugees, and asylum seekers who cross borders to find safety and opportunity. Embolden leaders to draft compassionate policies on behalf of migrants and those who assist them. God of grace, hear our prayer. Love bears, believes, hopes, and endures all things. Comfort with your love all who are lonely, fearful, or brokenhearted. Sustain the hope of all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. We lift in prayer this day, Shiva Basil, Richard Bolin, Yvonne Bondis, Terry Carter, Galen Cross, Ansel Fisher, Diane Froslin, Lauren Gersh, Jenny Gertzema, Laverne Hammer, Janet Hart, Lenora Haltor, Susan Hunstead, Laura Keeker, Sonia Lupke, Don Mackey, Cindy Malone, Hannah Ulrich, Patty Ann Meeks, Gary Miller, Amira Norland, Ruth Olson, Trevor Randall, Roald Revney, Ryan Ringen, Erica Rodriguez, Natasha Schiffler, Audrey Schiller, Andy Swanson, Carol Tuey, Evan Winkleman, Jerry Winnen, Everett Wright, and Rita Zollers. God of grace, hear our prayer. Your grace falls upon young and old alike. Bless the gifts of children in this congregation and in this community. Give us humble hearts to follow their leadership. Inspire us with their laughter, their insight, and their curiosity. God of grace, hear our prayer. We give you thanks for new life and signs of your grace, O Lord, for the newly born Charlie Dolores Klug, for Richard Bolin celebrating his 97th birthday, for Lydia Ann Anderson celebrating her first baptismal birthday, and for all our fifth graders receiving First Communion next Sunday. God of grace, hear our prayer. We praise you for those who have gone before us and now see you face to face. We remember in prayer this day Alvin Sandmeyer and Terry Broughton and pray for their families and friends 
Abide with us in this mortal life, O Lord, until we rest in the arms of your never-ending love. God of grace, hear our prayer. Since we have such great hope in your promises, O God, we lift these and all our prayers to you in confidence and faith through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. At this time, we recognize the offerings that we bring to the altar. Um, uh, we thank you for uh, all of the offerings uh, that you give, whether it be your time, your talent, um, offerings of your financial um, and that we remember that all of these come from God first. Let us pray. Blessed are you, O God, sovereign of the universe. You offer us new beginnings and guide us on our journey. Lead us, nourish us, and prepare us to carry your love to a world in need. In the name of Christ, our light. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Mine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us join together in song, singing our sending song, hymn number 538. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. A couple of announcements uh, for our annual meeting. We'll start at 10.30, so we have some time in between. We wish we could offer you a cup of coffee and things, but we just don't feel that that's a safe, way to, uh, to do, safe thing to do right now. Uh, so please uh, mingle, I guess, if you're going to stay for the meeting. Uh, go home if you're not. You could go home and tune in uh, by live stream, if you'd li uh, excuse me, by Zoom, if you'd like. Uh, but uh, 10.30 is when we'll start our meeting. Mm -hmm. 